So low risk mothers, we give the COVID shield and high risk mothers, we give the Covaxin like PI, GDM and anemia. And the interval between these two, the Covaxin, the interval is lesser, one month is enough and the COVID shield requires three months. Hi students, welcome back. Today we'll be doing the high yield topic in obstetrics and that is antenatal care. Uh, well guys, this is what we do for a living, antenatal care. And the way we examine women who are pregnant and the history which we take and the trimester wise specifications, all of you have gone through this, but it makes good sense to revise them today and find out those small bits, those small specifications which keep coming as your exam questions. All right, so don't leave your homes without reading the antenatal care topics. All right, so we'll see that the antenatal care, we have a certain objective you know when these pregnant women come to us in the OPD what are we trying to take care of throughout her pregnancy and those objects yes they are here so the objectives of antenatal care to bring down the morbidity and mortality obviously of the mother and the child and what are we going to look specifically for we are going to do the diagnosis of pregnancy properly and monitoring the health and status of the mother and the fetus identification of the high risk pregnancies you know there are certain pregnancies like twins and uh, short status pregnancies the ones which are going to demand more attention as compared to the others we're going to find them right now detection of associated medical surgical and gynecological disorders education of women regarding the effects of drugs on the fetus and selecting the cases for hospital and for domiciliary deliveries preparing the mother for breastfeeding this is the time when you tell her that yes you are going to be breastfeeding within one hour of the time when the baby is born whether you have a normal delivery or a cesarean and we're going to make sure that the nurses who are going to take care of you whichever hospital you deliver or whichever primary health center you deliver they're going to start breastfeeding for the child immediately and uh, we should always find out uh, maternal infections which may be present and lurking around which can be cause of preterm rupture of membranes and chorioamnionitis and we must also take this opportunity to screen for cervical cancers see uh, not just cervical cancer even for breast cancer see uh, you know women in our country uh, they are still reluctant to come to the outpatient departments and get themselves examined and deliver in the hospitals. Yes, it is increasing now. Of course, uh, the healthcare setup has become so smart that we are reaching these women and we are having more outreach hospitals. But still, a uh, majority of women would be very happy delivering at home. And uh, when they finally decide to come and show a doctor for the deliveries, we catch this as an opportunity for screening for cancer cervix and breast specifically. You know, these are the most common cancers of women in India, isn't it? Most common CA breast and the most common genital cancer, CA cervix. And mind you, these are the two cancers you should know always before you go for any exam, the staging also. So yes, and we should take this opportunity to also promote the family planning. Now family planning, if we start telling them about the importance of limiting the family size, then this is that opportunity you should not lose. Okay, so these are the objectives and uh, this is what I was taught when I was in my college, my alma mater, JIPMA, and this is exactly the antenatal record from that college. And uh, I'm proud to say that my antenatal record, I still have it with me and uh, I checked up with my college. The objectives are still very much the same. So please go ahead and remember them as very important aspects when you're uh, seeing pregnant women in the antenatal OPDs. Now, what are the high risk pregnancies? Uh, like I told you, short stated women, elderly or teenage pregnancies, grand multipara. And uh, grand multipara, if you understand that any woman who's delivered, uh, you know, four children is a, uh, is a grand multipara. So the fifth pregnancy is the time when she's having many more risks as compared to women who are pregnant for the first or the second time. So that's why a grand multipara means a woman who's delivered four children and coming for the fifth, sixth or seventh pregnancy. Okay, so women who have bad obstetric histories and things like medical disorders, exposure to medications, fetal anomalies, etc. So this is part of the record in the hospital where I'm working right now. And uh, I've just uh, enumerated a few facts which make me think that this woman is a high risk pregnancy. So find out the high risk pregnancies and then you must always try and make sure with your antenatal care that you bring down the maternal mortality and the infant mortality ratio. So if you see the infant mortality rate and the maternal mortality rate, it is now around 113 for the maternal mortality rate. Uh, you know, long time back when I was uh, intern, 1994-95, I remember the maternal mortality rate to be as high as 556 and when i was a pg we brought it down to something like in the you know uh, 300s and late 300s 
and then now it is as low as 113 but still we would want always to keep it below 100 and uh, you know i would want to keep it at zero but then let's be realistic if you can bring it down to less than 100 what we had planned in the year 2000 and if we can achieve it even this year i'll be the happiest so 113 is like almost there and uh, it's much better than what was uh, at my time when i was an intern so it goes to say that the gynecologists of this country are working hard isn't it the obstetricians are taking care of women the healthcare facilities are becoming better and women are delivering in the hospitals to bring this rate down to 113 now and the neonatal mortality rate is 21 so the idea of objectives and to teach you that is to keep the maternal mortality in the infant mortality ratio to a acceptable limit okay apart from the uh, you know the classification of the patients who are coming uh, to the antenatal care as high risk and low risk we must also know that the cesarean rate of a hospital you know there is this uh, method of analyzing that how many cesareans are the hospitals across the world doing and what are the common indications and to have a data which is easily accessible across the world on the online sources and it is an easy source of comparing the data of your hospital to that one big hospital which is having good rates and to the general data of the all hospitals of the world put together so that was a method by which we have realized that we can compare all the data of the cesarean rates and the indication for season rates by one classification system known as the Robson's classification. And this was incidentally a question which came to you last year that Robson's classification is used for what? It is for categorizing the incidence and the indications of cesarean sections across the world. So it is also known as the 10 group classification system. It was advocated by the WHO in 2015 and also accepted by the International Federations of Gynecologists and Obstetricians. So this is known as a global standard for assessing, monitoring and comparing cesarean delivery rates within and between healthcare facilities. So yes, uh, this 10 group classification system has these 10 groups uh, by which uh, uh, we can find out what are the most common indications and the uh, the rare indications for which cesareans are done. So uh, if you can see that there is this uh, contribution of the cesarean rates like if you see uh, 5.3 uh, of the cesareans, you know, the if the cesarean rate across the world, let's say is around 23%, a good season rate of any uh, tertiary hospital should not be more than 15 to 20 percent but yes uh, big hospitals get a lot of high risk pregnancies so um, if there is a cumulative rate of 23 percent of season sections across the world then uh, yes uh, the good hospitals are doing good amount of uh, uh, you know uh, great amount of work to contain this season rate but yes if you keep it between 15 to 20 it's ideal 23 in fact is perfect in the current scenario because quite a lot of private hospitals in our country are running the season rates as as high as 90 percent you know that isn't it so out of these 23 percent if you see i was trying to tell you the 5.3 percent rate is for the nulliparous single cephalic presentation babies which are more than 37 weeks and they've been uh, induced for labor but because of let's say fetal distress they ended up uh, for a cesarean section so that is the uh, very common contribution then another common contribution is for the one which are the previous cesareans and they are beyond 37 weeks and um, one more is the nulliparous breeds so contrary to what you people believe that uh, nulliparous breeds everywhere across the world they must be doing a cesarean Look, it has become a practice in private, but that is nulliparous breeds means the women who are pregnant for the first time and now they're having a breach. So a primary breach is not an outright indication for a cesarean section. Okay, it's an indication for keeping this woman in the uh, big hospitals, the tertiary care setups and making sure that a trained obstetrician is there to monitor the labor and conduct the delivery. And in that scenario, you can give trial of labor. Why are we teaching you breach uh, deliveries? Because we know that breaches will deliver. It's not that breach delivery is not going to happen. We ask you, even as your MBBS exam, remember we were asking you breach presentations, isn't it? We are teaching you because it is done. It's not because we are going to do cesareans and just for the sake of uh, theory, we are teaching you, okay? So breaches do have a uh, normal delivery and you see they are not contributing so much, okay? It's 1.9% and you must see what is the next, the 
seventh classification is the multiparous that is the women multiparous breaches means the woman who had a normal delivery before and now they're coming for the second or third delivery and they're having a breach presentation and see they are lesser than the primary breach if you compare so 1.4 that means it is lesser than the incidence of even primary that means women who had a delivery and second time they have a cesarean they are definitely going for a normal delivery all right so i was trying to tell you the 10 group classification system or the robson's classification because this came in your exam and you should understand that this is a system which is in place now across the world for comparing the cesarean rates all right simply put it is just comparing across the world the cesarean rates uh, i did not know where to put this slide basically because uh, i wanted to tell you this in antenatal care so that you know that uh, cesareans should not be uh, you know anything more than 20 percent and if a hospital is having more than 30 percent then even if it's a high uh, you know tertiary care setup which is having a lot of high risk pregnancies there is something going wrong there with the obstetrics department you must uh, you know uh, re-motivate them to try and do more normal deliveries more than 30 is totally totally unacceptable all right and if it is 90 percent then the government gets behind you and asks you to give an explanation why your hospital is having 90 percent so let's see some definitions which are very uh, regularly asked in your exams so what is gravida gravida is a state of being pregnant That means if a woman is pregnant right now, then we call her a gravid woman. We say gravida 1, gravida 2 or 3. Uh, gravida 4 means she is pregnant for the fourth time. All right. And gravida 5 means the grand, okay. She, we say it's a grand multi-para, you know, beyond 4, she's going to that grand stage. Okay. So gravida is a state of being pregnant right now. Okay. You will not call a woman a gravida if she's not pregnant. Then what is para? The para is that uh, a woman has attained parity that means she has taken a pregnancy beyond the stage of viability now this is a cause of uh, confusion um, especially in our setup because we are reading western books which say a viability is beyond 24 weeks or the western setup uh, beyond uh, europe if you go to usa they say viability is beyond 20 weeks so for us, viability is even now beyond 28 weeks. So when we say that a pregnancy has gone beyond 28 weeks, we say she's attained parity. That means if a woman has delivered a child, let's say at uh, uh, 38, 39 weeks, she's para. Okay. If she's delivered a child even at 32, she is para. Okay. So if she's delivered two children, then we say para two. All right. Now, uh, what is... Um, the common way of using this gravida and para the common way you know there are uh, some questions which have come in a different method also for you so i'll discuss that even so what is a nulli para now nulli para is a person who is never delivered okay she's never been uh, pregnant and she's never uh, had a uh, delivery so that is never being pregnant never been pregnant and what is a primary para first pregnancy She's a primary para, okay? And uh, suppose a woman is pregnant for the first time, I know that she's high risk for PIH, okay? Primary para. And the, again, the grand multis are risk for PIH, okay? She's a primary para, pregnant for the first time. More counseling, more making understand that uh, normal delivery is better than cesarean deliveries, you know? A lot of talking goes on and a lot of understanding of the process of labor and trying to make understand the importance of going through the process of normal delivery. Then multi para is a woman who is pregnant more than uh, one time that is two and more okay so two and more pregnancies if she's pregnant for and she's delivered we call it a multi para if she's delivered two three four five whatever anything more than one is multi para and grand multi para i've already told you two three times in this discussion is uh, the woman who's delivered four children is known as a multi para so beyond four is a multi para and if she's pregnant we again say she's a a uh, grand multi para because she is now pregnant for the fifth time, sixth time, seventh time. We say that she is a woman who is pregnant for the fifth time and she's had four deliveries earlier. Okay, so grand multi para, the one who delivered more than four. So now let's take some examples of uh, how we can uh, tell the obstetric formula of a woman. Suppose she is uh, pregnant now and she has two children earlier and let's say one abortion so pregnancy means she is gravid she had two children that means she's delivered twice which have gone beyond parity so she is para 2 
and one abortion a1 so total three pregnancies and she's pregnant now so grad of four para two and a1 now before this a1 we must also write how many children are living so we can write before that live two so grad of four para two live two a1 that's the formula of this woman now if she's not pregnant suppose she's not pregnant then we write it para 2 live 2 a1 we do not have to write the g here and uh, especially when the woman is 60 years it's very embarrassing you know when the 60 year old woman comes to the outpatient department and says you know she has prolapse and you're seeing a woman who has prolapsed she's 60 years odd uh, of age and then you write the formula grada 4 para 2 live 1 abortion 1 no, that's absurd you know first of all she is not said she is pregnant and secondly she is 60 years okay so please uh, don't write gravida as a habit okay till she is pregnant you don't write that now uh, there is another information which i have to give is regarding twins suppose she is uh, pregnant now for the second time and she had one uh, delivery okay she is delivered only once and that is twins and she is pregnant now if she is pregnant for the second time, we say gravida 2. She has delivered one child, that means parity once. And suppose they are both are living. So they are living children, the two living children. So we call it life 2. We don't call it para 2. Now this is very important. In twins, suppose she is having a previous twin delivery and she is pregnant only for the second time. So she has attained parity once. She has delivered twins, yes, but that was one pregnancy. So that one pregnancy, we say, has gone beyond the stage of the viability, beyond 28 weeks. Now she's delivered, uh, one pregnancy has delivered two children. So we say parity once, but children two. That means life two. Now this is the common method of telling the obstetric formula of a lady. Now, the problem comes when uh, they want to ask you some vague question and not regularly used anywhere in the world, but in some localities, you know, it's not that it's a very common formula. Yes, you know what I'm talking. I'm talking to you about the GT PAL system. So this is a, a more uh, elaborate kind of method of mentioning the status of children which have delivered. So yes, the gravita of course stays the same. Now, the parity is distributed into term and preterm so we say that she's delivered one child at term two preterm deliveries and uh, she's had no abortions and all these children which delivered one was term and one was preterm all of these children are now alive so we say live three so grad of four term one preterm two so that is saying that she's had three deliveries and then there was no abortions so we say three living children and she's pregnant for the fourth time so yes that is the gt pal system and with the gt pal system we must always uh, understand that uh, this is not a common method of usage in our country i understand there was a question on this around three years back and a lot of you have been asking me about this it is just a method of telling more details of the child which was delivered we know parity is that the child has uh, delivered after 28 weeks of pregnancy now whether it was from 28 to 37 it becomes preterm and it is after 37 it becomes term so we are just splitting the para into term and preterm and it is not a common method please stick to what i've taught you the general method but since you are going to write a PG entrance exam, I must also tell you what is term and preterm, the GTPAL system. Okay. Now let's see how we calculate the expected date of delivery. Now, you know, a pregnancy is 280 days and we can also call it 40 weeks. But the common method is knowing that it is nine months and seven days. So if the calculation is done by the Negley's rule, which is using the nine months plus seven days calculation and you know this very well that whenever she had a last period to that the from the first day of the LMP okay not from any other time from the first day of LMP suppose it is today 8th of August and 8th of August was the last menstrual period 
and she gets pregnant you know 8th of September she does not get her uh, period then the pregnancy test is positive so LMP was 8th of August so we add 9 months and 7 days to this now how complicated that be you know you have to just add 9 months so from August you calculate 9 months so it goes uh, September October November December January February March April May May is the ninth month so that is 8th of uh, May and you add 7 days so that is 15th of May 22 is the expected date of delivery we call it the EDD you know that very well now some of you don't want to add nine months so we say since the it's a 12 month uh, uh, circle of uh, you know in a year 12 month circle so either you can add nine months or you can subtract three months you'll still reach May so if it is 8th of August you can add nine months you'll reach May or you can subtract three months that is you will go from August back to July then to June and then to May so you minus three months you reach May again again you reach May you reach 8th of May but you have to add seven days don't get confused that's a when we uh, subtract three months do we add seven days or subtract seven days now that's where you get confused the pregnancy is not going to change the duration is not going to change it is just that you don't want to add nine months and then reach May you want to do a quick calculation so from August you subtract three months and you still reach May okay so from August it is uh, July backwards that is July June and May May 8th plus seven days is 15th of May again so either way you can do this and get to the same conclusion and don't get confused in this Nagli's formula and uh, that is nine months and seven days most of you knew this but some of you keep getting confused because uh, you know uh, you don't like you don't like obstetrics so much and you uh, keep avoiding going to the OPDs and I know it happens that uh, quite a few of you don't want to do this exercise but then it comes in the exams what can you do about that so if you know this it's nice uh, mind you uh, we must always take a normal uh, menstrual history or an abnormal menstrual history if she had if she had delayed cycles if she had short cycles then that calculation also goes into calculating the expected date of periods because if it is uh, too delayed a cycle then suppose it is delayed by three weeks or four weeks and she's getting her period once in uh, you know eight weeks then that four weeks is extra so we must take out those four weeks from the calculation okay and uh, what is a very simple rule of uh, you know those women who don't know their LMP well so she does not know her last period and she says sir I'm pregnant uh, when was the period uh, well I don't remember sir uh, because uh, I had some erratic cycles so if she at least remembers that you did a pregnancy test at home isn't it that's how you came to me that you were not having regular periods your periods were irregular but you got pregnant you know you thought that you're not getting periods for a long time you did a pregnancy test so if a woman does a pregnancy test it is that day if it is positive then that is at least five weeks of pregnancy so suppose she says that uh, her pregnancy test was positive let's say on uh, 6th of July then 6th of July was at least five weeks of pregnancy and today is 8th of August you can add another uh, you know uh, 28 29 days to that duration of pregnancy and calculate the time she's pregnant today so whenever she remembers she did a pregnancy test date of preg test being positive that is at least five weeks of pregnancy so by history you can use this information to say she was at least five weeks when the uh, pregnancy test came positive also uh, if we don't know the dates of the woman and she doesn't remember that uh, when she had a period apart from this method we can also do a ultrasound and the first trimester ultrasound correlates with the gestation very well the error is just plus minus one weeks so if you get a first trimester ultrasound done then also you are as good as the exact gestational age you have calculated just almost the exact gestational age which she actually is okay so that's the importance of uh, knowing the dates properly and how we calculate the expected date of delivery right let's move on to the diagnosis of pregnancy how do we diagnose that the woman is pregnant the day the woman misses a period suppose uh, her last period is uh, 8th of August and she misses period on 8th of September then uh, how much is the pregnancy duration so very simple that from 8th of August 
to 8th of September. How many days it is? August 8th. That means uh, 23 days, month of 31 days, isn't it? 23 days are remaining in August. And September 8th, she is pregnant. So, how many days? It is 31 days of pregnancy. She misses a period on 8th of September. And the pregnancy test comes positive. Then how many days or weeks is the pregnancy? It is 31 days. So, 31 divided by 7. 7 fours are 28. Balance 3. So, 4 weeks plus 3 days is the pregnancy of this woman when she misses a period on 8th of September. So, yes, if she is 4 weeks plus 3 days, will the pregnancy test come positive? Okay, I will tell you again. Suppose a LMP is, her last menstrual period is 8th of August and September 8th. Okay, she misses her period. Then, the pregnancy duration is 4 weeks plus 3 days. Whether the pregnancy test will come positive? Forget the test being coming positive. You can also see this pregnancy on an ultrasound now. So, yes, by slight test, it will be positive in 60 to 70 percent of cases. And by doing the beta SCG estimation by ELISA, it will be up to 95 percent positive. And radio immuno assay and you know, immuno radiometric assay will be 100 percent positive on this day. Okay. And on the ultrasound, we have always told you this that on a transvaginal sonography, you can see a sac as early as 4 plus weeks and a cardiac activity at 5 weeks plus and by a trans abdominal sonography at 5 plus weeks you can see a sac and 6 plus weeks you can see a cardiac activity. So, this is the common uh, information which has been discussed with you in uh, many parts of the forum of the Praplata forum where we meet and also on the app. But uh, don't miss out on this because uh, some of you get confused when the exam question comes. You know, I've told you that let's say by a transvaginal sonography, the cardiac activity is seen at 5 plus weeks. So, it is 5 weeks plus 3 days. Some books say 5 weeks plus 5 days. So, let us say 5 weeks plus 3 days. Now, some student asked me, Sir, you said it is 5 weeks plus 3 days, but my book says it is 6th week. It means the same, isn't it? 5 weeks and 3 days, that means the 6th week is running, isn't it? So, do not get confused with these small details, alright? Uh, that is why if you read more books, you tend to uh, get confused a little bit sometimes with the information which is there in different guides. So, somebody may say that it is 5 weeks plus 3 days, but other book might say that the cardiac activity by a transvaginal sonography is seen in the 6th week. It is the same, 5 weeks and 3 days is actually the 6th week running, alright? So, let us move on and see how we go about diagnosing pregnancy by a per vaginal examination. It can help that the size of the uterus, if she's pregnant, is not the normal size now. You know, if it uh, is a pear sh uh, shape and a pear size uh, uterus, normally when we do a per vaginal examination of a non pregnant woman, it becomes like a small orange by six weeks, a large orange by around eight weeks and a grapefruit size by 12 weeks. So, that grapefruit is uh, uh, much bigger than a large orange also. So, we say uh, when we see that size on a per vaginal examination, it is uh, basically a bimanual examination. You have put two fingers in the vagina and one hand is on the top of the lower abdomen of the pregnant woman and with that gently we can see the size of the uterus. Okay. Uh, many other things we have discussed in the physiology of pregnancy chapter and the diagnosis of pregnancy chapter. This is, uh, uh, you know, uh, amalgamation of important facts when we are taking care of a pregnant woman in the outpatient department. And these are the facts we must have together from all the chapters of obstetrics. These are the, uh, you know, small bits which should be there in our mind when we are seeing a woman in the outpatient department. So, that's why I've just got an amalgamation of information from various topics of the obstetrics book. Okay. So, what are the trimesters and what is the uh, time when viability is achieved? So, trimester, traditionally we say first trimester is the first week to the twelfth week. Now, this is what we traditionally say, but yes, uh, you see the American books, they say uh, from first week to the fourteenth week. So, you know, uh, first week to the 12th week and then 12th week to the 28th week and 28 weeks to the 42nd week. This is the first, second and third trimester and mostly they have not asked you this question because even the examiners are aware that the Americans keep saying till 14 weeks. 
but if in the exam it comes you know if they really say it is uh, first week to 12 or it is first week to 14 then i think you go ahead and mark this one i know uh, you know i'm contradicting myself here itself but um, you know try and understand that first trimester practically and almost always everywhere uh, is from first week to the 12th week and for the sake of theory they have said this in the american system they take it up to 14 weeks okay now the viability is uh, beyond the second trimester we say after 28 weeks is the third trimester and that is also the time when the baby is viable that means can survive viable pregnancy now if a woman is 29 30 weeks i know that even if she delivers preterm let's say 30 weeks this baby will survive it's a viable option this pregnancy is viable because baby can survive so viability after 28 weeks is almost 50 percent and more in our country and before 28 weeks if they deliver 90 percent children they don't survive 90% children don't survive. So that's why viability is after 28 weeks in our country. Now, of course, you may say that in your hospital, uh, pediatricians have been saving babies routinely at 26 and 27 weeks and many children have survived. I agree. A lot of hospitals and many hospitals where I've also worked, children regularly make it in good nurseries around 26, 27 weeks, even 25 weeks sometimes they made it. But yes, those are the few who make it most of these they die in the labor rooms itself and they don't even reach the stage of discussion with the uh, interns who are working you know overnight some uh, children would have delivered as preterm and uh, before 28 weeks that is uh, pre viability i meant to say and they would have expired so yes uh, there are far more children who die before 28 weeks than the ones who make it okay so now this also is uh, you know a little uh, refutable if you go by the American system because for them the second trimester is not till 28 weeks it's till 20 weeks and from 20 to 42 they say is the stage when babies can survive so strictly going by our system I would say 1 to 12 12 to 28 and 28 to 42 okay so read them uh, you know Western books they have very good uh, methods of making you things understand but the data you should understand from the Indian point of view okay so uh, what are the things we must see in the trimester wise visits and what all we are doing in the antenatal care now this is a very detailed uh, chart but we must take a complete history and always whenever she visits so that is done every time we must take the blood pressure and uh, the metal weight the pelvic and cervical examination funnel height fetal heart rate and the fetal position every time when they come and we must take the hemoglobin once when she comes in the first trimester first visit and then around the 24 to 28 weeks we must always check the uh, blood group and the rh factor do the antibody screening that is the indirect cum test we do the ict is to check for antibodies not just uh, to you know if the mother is rh negative we see the indirect cum test but there are far more antibodies far many more antibodies which can be there in a circulation so we always do the indirect cum test uh, most of us do it when the patient is there with us in the first trimester we must find out if there are antibodies in the blood apart from those against the rh antigen okay so it's not just the rh antigen system which is important many other antibodies can be there and then we have the glucose tolerance test see here all of you see 24 to 28 weeks this is where we do the gtt so this uh, brings to the point where i've always told you that gestational diabetes presents only beyond 24 weeks so don't get confused too much by the uh, american system which is used for reference so often in our setups now uh, look, uh, we understand that gestation diabetes mellitus, when we say, is a state which is because of insulin resistance and because of the insulin destruction and that all presents around 24 weeks and beyond. So, sugars will increase at that time. That's why we should do the GTT then. And if the sugars are high, we say it is gestation diabetes mellitus. But if the sugars are high before that time, let's say 10th weeks or, uh, you know, 14 weeks, then we say the woman is having these high sugars probably before she was pregnant okay we've diagnosed them now so this is over diabetes which is presenting in pregnancy so very important 
we say sugars high beyond 24 weeks as gestation diabetes mellitus and there are some definitions which confuse you that they say that uh, high sugars at any time in pregnancy is gestation diabetes that one definition confuses you a lot and uh, please go back uh, and uh, remember what i've told you just now beyond 24 weeks is gdm and remember if there is gdm it does not cause anomalies because it comes after 24 weeks and the organogenesis completes by 12 weeks okay so that's why this is uh, straight from williams obstetrics and glucose tolerance test which you know is done by the 75 grams of glucose and there are only three values now it's a one step test and it is done at 24 to 28 weeks all right there are many other things which are done in the screening and uh, we always do the urine protein and sugar estimation and we'll do the rubella serology when the woman comes in the first trimester and of course these sexually transmitted diseases see the syphilis serology you know the rpr is always done in uh, early pregnancy but you must always look for gonococcal and chlamydial screening you must find out in the history and if the history is suggestive then you will offer the uh, gonococcal screening also of course chlamydial screening should be done and uh, hepatitis hepatitis uh, b and the hiv serology is done in all pregnancies so these are the tests which we should do and uh, when we should do them that also i've discussed so the question comes to you which of the following is not done in the first trimester or which of the following is done in the patients who are uh, coming regularly or in the patients who are having suggestive history like that kind of questions can come to you all right and of course in all of this uh, we must always remember that the pap smear this is part of the first trimester very very important because this is one of the objectives of the antenatal care i told you in the beginning itself that we must look for cancer cervix and uh, we must look for cancer breast and uh, this is a good time to catch women and find out if they are having any of these uh, you know uh, pre-malignant lesions also we must find out. So pap smear in the first trimester very important in the first visit itself. Okay so how many visits should be there now traditionally once every four weeks till 28 weeks and then after that every two weeks and uh, after the 36 weeks has gone then the woman should come every week to the hospital till she delivers now that is what is ideal this is what we say ideally this is what she should be doing but uh, uh, healthcare setups uh, where uh, you know women are in the underdeveloped or the developing countries there it's very tough to get these women convinced to come so frequently to the hospital so we say at least these many visits are good so you know when we were uh, students we used to say that the pregnant woman even if she comes at least thrice in the whole of pregnancy then she is likely to have a better outcome then it became four uh, you know uh, by the who and the latest recommendation by who and 2016 is that they should have at least one visit in the first trimester two visits in the second trimester and five visits in the third trimester if she can manage this then this is as good as it gets you know ideally we say what i've taught you but at least at least eight visits you know totaling eight visits is what is recommended by who and it is not four okay four is way beyond it was the earlier model before 2016 now we say at least eight visits okay so what are the things we should take care uh, when the woman has come to you in a pregnancy we always find out trimester wise history you know you must be doing this in your final exam so many times that in the first trimester whether she's had any fever with rash whether there was drug intake whether there was radiation whether there was bleeding did she take folic acid you know like that we verbatim ask these questions so we must always do that and always find out whether she had any history of hyperemesis and of course this is the time to find out the blood group and the indirect comb test and like i told you in the previous slide you must do the pap smear very important in the first trimester is the radiation exposure now radiation exposure uh, you know i'll just tell you the radiation exposure the dose of radiation is in the units called rads and uh, one gray is 100 rads and this is the effective radiation dose it is taken in sieverts and one sievert is 100 rem so most of the exam question come in rads to you and if they say uh, in gray then you must remember this conversion so what is the no observed adverse effect level the noel level less than five rads is absolutely safe and generally the threshold for having any 
fetal problems any fetal congenital malformations is beyond 20 rads so we generally say 5 to 10 rads is safe and that's generally what is the exam question so if they ask you to choose between 5 and 10 of course choose 5 but generally 5 to 10 rads is a safe dose so that's like one or two x-rays in pregnancy you know the woman did not know that she's pregnant or the you know the resident who was taking care of a woman who came let's say with the cuff and COVID time I mean the woman has uh, fever and there are so many patients who are having COVID and this resident said at least get an x-ray done and the patient was pregnant. It has happened so many times and then we forget to ask that uh, whether she is having her periods missed. Sometimes the patients also don't know that they are pregnant. So one x-ray or even two x-rays please don't tell the mother to abort the child. Yes, we know that radiation in the antenatal period, there can be abortions, growth restriction, congenital malformations, microcephaly, mental retardation. We know all of this. But one or two chest x-rays does not do any of that. So 5 to 10 rads is absolutely safe. And the radiation which is going to cause any problems is actually more than 20 rads. Okay. Of course, if a CT scan is done inadvertently, if it is done in a pregnant woman, then that is a cause for great concern and then you have to advise an abortion because that is definitely CT scan is much more far more radiation than an x-ray so yes please CT scan uh, even the technicians are very very smart they will not do a CT scan till they're convinced you know you might be a very busy resident but the technician who is doing he's doing a shift duty remember that's why it is good that at least they are doing shift duties they are aware that okay in my eight hours i cannot be thinking of sleeping residents are so tired that sometimes things get missed especially when there is so much of workload and uh, hats off to our indian residents we work so hard but yes uh, our technicians work just as hard and the shift duties which they are doing they make sure that they always find out regarding the pregnancy status and you sometimes get irritated that you get a call that the technician is not doing the scan the CT scan especially because he does not know the pregnancy status and he'll ask the resident or the intern to come and make a mention about the pregnancy status if they have not done you would always see that and that always takes care at least the last step before the radiation exposure is given these technicians take care of that at least okay so radiation exposure this question has come many times and also remember very important that from 8 weeks to 15 weeks the fetus is most susceptible to radiation induced mental retardation and uh, before 8 weeks and after 20 weeks the problems of mental retardation are not so much okay second trimester what are we doing we are checking the blood pressure we are asking for the fetal movement especially in the second trimester because quickening is generally around uh, 16 weeks odd or 18 weeks sometimes in multigravidas and around 20 22 weeks in primary gravidas so after 16 weeks theoretically exam question women can feel fetal movements and uh, ask for pain and bleeding ask if they've got an anomaly scan done now the anomaly scan uh, is a uh, general uh, you know the uh, the trend is that we should do it around 18 to 19 weeks because if something goes wrong in the scan you know if there is a major defect for which abortion has to be done before 20 weeks you can do an abortion now that limit has now increased you know this year in 2021 the uh, the upper house and the lower house have passed the amendment to the mtp act mm -hmm. and the president has already signed on it so yes now we say 24 weeks is the time till when medical termination of pregnancy can be done so uh, we can do the anomaly scan even at around 22 23 weeks but wait hold on we know that the mtp now is 24 weeks whether it is implemented or not that's what none of us know there's no implementation of it yet it has been approved by the president so if they ask you in the exam what is the approved time till when medical termination of pregnancy can now be done a straightforward question go ahead and mark 24 weeks but so far you can go back to your hospitals and find out has it been implemented it's not been implemented so there's a slight uh, you know uh, hitch still but yes they'll ask you the easy question what is the new date you know when was the uh, latest amendment to the mtp act done something like that they'll ask you and that is in the year 2021 the president has signed the bill implementation let's wait so uh, we can look for the anomaly scan around 18 19 weeks and uh, till 20 weeks if we find something wrong we can go and abort and after 20 uh, weeks there was a problem that if you do an abortion you must get approved by a board so now that has become 24 weeks 
okay now vaccinations very important tetanus vaccination all of you know we can uh, start doing the tetanus vaccination by around 16 weeks and beyond and there are two doses given at four weeks interval so suppose she takes the first dose on the 16th week the next one can be taken on the 20th week and if she's pregnant for the second time and the previous pregnancy is beyond three years then she has to take two again okay so generally the tetanus vaccine which is given in pregnancy is good for three years earlier we said five years now we say it is three years so yes within three years if she's pregnant if she is pregnant again then only one dose is given and if it is beyond three years she takes the full course that is two injections at the gap of four weeks of course now uh, you know we uh, rather than just giving the tetanus vaccine a lot of people are giving the t dab so the t dab uh, vaccine can be given of course uh, tt uh, given is enough but a lot of people nowadays give the td vaccine that is the tetanus and the um, diphtheria vaccine or the t dab that is tetanus diphtheria and the acidula petrosis vaccine so yes uh, this can be given now there's a whole lot of discussion and still a lot of confusion about the covid vaccine and uh, please remember that the covid vaccine which we are giving is now more or less acceptable in pregnancy by almost all the recommendations you know whether it's the who or the indian recommendations by the uh, foxy that is the federations of obstetricians and gynecologists of india or it is the uh, family welfare department you know the ministry of health and family welfare most of them recommend that from the second trimester we can give the covid vaccine so i'll come to detail of the covid vaccine now in pregnancy and in breastfeeding we are giving with of course a informed choice you know that we don't know much about the covid uh, disease because it is just coming to being right now for the last two years and the effect may or may not be there but so far what we've done uh, you know the studies which we've done and the use which have been done in pregnant women and breastfeeding women it has been beneficial because if a pregnant woman gets covid then her outcome because of COVID is much better than those who have not taken the vaccine. So with that logic, in pregnancy and in breastfeeding, we are giving the COVID vaccine now. More details I'll tell you after I discuss uh, the other vaccines. So toxides like tetanus can be given in pregnancy. Kill vaccines can be given in pregnancy like the influenza, pneumococcus, hepatitis B, meningococcus vaccine, rabies vaccine and the typhoid vaccine can be given. But most live vaccines are contraindicated like varicella, measles, mumps, rubella, polio, chickenpox, the live attenuated vaccine, you know, the polio uh, vaccine is contraindicated, chickenpox, yellow fever and smallpox are not given. But yes, you must see polio and yellow fever I have given in a brown color because if the person is going to an endemic area, then if there's a requirement, then you can take certain risk and go ahead and give because uh, the chances of problems are much lesser and the benefits are more. Then if they're going to endemic area, especially with yellow fever, then you can give it in pregnancy. So smallpox is that one vaccine which is a proven teratogen. It is going to cause problems in the fetus. So that's why smallpox vaccine, we know much about that and definitely should not be given in pregnancy. Now, all these vaccines which are contraindicated and if they are given to any woman then one month should pass before pregnancy is planned okay at least one month should pass so this question has come for the mmr vaccine the rubella discussion it has come many times that if somebody is taking the rubella vaccine how early she can try a pregnancy i would say three months at least but yes if you want to write an answer in the mcq exam then at least one month she should not get pregnant okay fine Immunoglobins, safe for the post-exposure prophylaxis are the ones like for against the hepatitis B and hepatitis A and the immunoglobins for varicella and rabies infections. They are safe, can be given. Now, COVID vaccination, like I was mentioning, that it is uh, given to all pregnant women now and um, it can be given in all the trimesters. But yes, uh, most people say it is best given in the second trimester. So, low-risk mothers, we give the COVID shield. And high-risk mothers, we give the Covaxin, like PI, GDM, and anemia. And the interval between these two, the Covaxin, the interval is lesser. One month is enough. And the Covishield requires three months. Okay? So, that's the range also I've given. 
and uh, TD and COVID vaccines can be given on the same day if it is really required and so is the anti D and the COVID vaccine and COVID vaccine can be combined with blood transfusion and treatment for anemia like iron sucrose infusion. If woman is COVID positive then we must wait at least three months before the vaccination is given in pregnancy. Just like uh, what rules have been uh, laid down for the last six months, things became very clear. The second wave was a huge problem for the whole humanity and we as Indians also suffered so much and drastic losses of life. And uh, this taught us also a, a lot more than the previous wave and we learned that at least uh, three months should pass because the antibodies because the disease will protect against the next possible exposure and uh, till three months that exposure uh, of uh, this COVID disease is enough to give protection and after three months the next vaccine can be taken. Also you must remember that if a person is having COVID and is uh, going for a vaccination let's say within two weeks or three weeks he may still be infective to the person so giving the vaccine. So that is also one reason for which we say that at least three months if you're not having any problems regarding COVID, then it's a good time for you to come and get the uh, vaccination done. So there are two reasons. One is that the person who is going for the vaccine should not infect the people who are giving the vaccinations. And two is that the antibodies would be preventing uh, further infections with COVID. Okay, so can wait for three months before the next dose. Right, so what about weight gain in pregnancy? We are still in the second trimester discussions and we were discussing vaccines and vaccines are generally given in the second trimester. That's why we are still with the second trimester discussions and uh, probably this is the time when we should think about the weight gain and assess whether the weight gain is too much or too less because too much of weight gain and the water retention in pregnancy will tend to take the patient towards preeclampsia, isn't it? So a weight gain in pregnancy for the first trimester around 1.5 to 2.5 kgs weight is good and beyond that 500 grams per week in the second and the third trimester not more than that weight gain should happen. So generally we say around 12 to 15 kgs that's the general weight gain in pregnancies which is safe. So 12 to 15 kgs weight gain in pregnancy is the safe uh, uh, you know gain and if they really want you to put your finger at one of these figures you know 12 and 15 then go ahead and say 12 kgs is the normal weight gain in pregnancy. Now less than 12 kgs there is much lesser chances of preeclampsia, failed induction of labor, cephalopelvic disproportions and much lesser cesarean deliveries and large for gestational age neonates. Right. Now, coming to the third trimester, make sure that uh, the iron and calcium hematonics, like we call them, the hematonics are continuing and uh, she's not had any history of bleeding per vaginum. Blood pressure monitoring is done again and another scan for the fetal biometry to see, uh, like we call it the growth scan, isn't it? Because we've done the second trimester uh, scan for the anomalies, uh, like we call it the uh, you know the uh, level 2 ultrasonography which is done around 18-19 weeks we discussed that isn't it and uh, now we do the ultrasound for the fetal biometry to see if the parameters are uh, increasing proportionately or if there is a intrauterine growth restriction and uh, then of course ask for symptoms like headache, epigastric pain, dizziness, uh, associated edema, blurring of vision so all of these are suggesting the eclampsia okay and find out for urinary complaints because sometimes this asymptomatic bacteria, if you're neglecting, then they can go and cause full-fledged uh, pyelonephritis. And pyelonephritis in pregnancy can go and cause IUGRs, preterm labors, even abortions. So don't neglect urinary infections. Uh, earlier in the discussion, I've told you every time the pregnant woman comes to the OPD, do a urine examination for proteins and sugars, and that's extremely important. All right, and also look for. Uh, RBCs or for uh, pus cells in the urine and if you find them please go ahead and do a culture okay now uh, what do we do about uh, examination of pregnant woman of course BP and the weight and general examination and urine protein sugars like in every visit we must look for the fetal growth heart rate fetal activity movements of the fetus in the uh, uterus the mother will tell you about that and while you're examining also you can see fetal movements and assess the amniotic fluid volume clinically we can make out if the liquor is uh, good then you'll not feel the uh, parts of the fetus so easily but if they easily felt then it gives indication probably the liquor is less okay that is part of the examination not going to be uh, a direct question for you people in the exams but uh, it's good uh, information before we read more about the antenatal care now inspection and palpation in a pregnant woman this is regularly a question asked 
Now we must know that when a pregnant woman's uterus is growing, then how does it reach outside the pelvis? So if you see the uterus is in the pelvis and this suppose is the symphysis pubis, this is the umbilicus and the xiphysternum is here. You know a woman's uterus when it is just in the abdomen, just palpable in the abdomen, we know it's around 12 weeks. When it is at the level of the umbilicus, we say 24 weeks. And please don't get confused if somebody asks you upper level of the umbilicus or the lower level of umbilicus and the midline of the umbilicus, please. I have told you time and again, umbilicus is a rough estimation of 24 weeks. Please, the lower level of umbilicus and the upper level of umbilicus. Umbilicus is not a vernier scalper or something by which you can exactly find out the, it's a rough estimate of 24 weeks. And in uh, thin women, very, you know, taut abdomen, the umbilicus is pulled up a lot. And uh, in a woman who is pregnant for the third time, then the abdomen is pendulous and large abdomen pendulous, the umbilicus will be much lower. So just going by the umbilicus, please, it's around roughly 24 weeks, okay. Then and if the uterus is till the level of the xiphy sternum, we say 36 weeks and if it starts filling up the flanks and comes down a little in the height, then we say it's uh, 40 weeks. This is how we say the fundal height. Now, what is the symphysio fundal height? So, if you, if I show you the same abdomen in lateral view, suppose this is the xiphy sternum and this is the pubic symphysis and this is the uh, umbilicus here somewhere. So, this is the symphysis and this is the fundus here. So, this is the symphysio fundal height, okay. So, symphysio fundal height okay that correlates very well so you take a measuring tape and with that measuring tape you uh, you know put one end on the pubic symphysis and then you pull it across all of the abdomen till you feel the fundus of course you must always mark the fundus isn't it that's what they teach you in the opd so you mark the fundus and you measure the uh, symphysis fundal height and it correlates very well 20 weeks to 34 weeks of pregnancy the symphysis fundal height correlates suppose we say by the symphysis funnel height is 28 weeks then the pregnancy is 28 weeks the uterine height is 28 weeks and the pregnancy also will be 28 weeks so it correlates well with the exact gestational age but that is up to 34 weeks and from 20 to 34 weeks okay fine so let us see the grips which are also a frequent discussion amongst you people and you keep getting confused and also keep coming in exams. So Leupold grips, there are four grips of Leupold that is grip 1 and this is grip 2 and 3 and 4. Now the grip 3 and 4 are also known as the Paulic 1 and Paulic 2. So we also call them the pelvic grips. So, Pauli grips or the pelvic grips, we call them the first and the second, uh, uh, you know, uh, pelvic grips or the Pauli grips and they correspond to the third and the fourth Leopold grips, okay, or we call them the Leopold maneuvers. So, you know, keep this in your mind and don't get confused about this any further. I know uh, some books uh, have given this in a different way and uh, when you read uh, many books, you keep getting confused also so many times. So I'll just tell you a little bit more detail about this and I tell you this with a lot of conviction and this is straight from Williams Obstetrics and this is what we do in our antenatal OPDs and all of you who worked in uh, hospitals and have done your internship, you'll understand that what I'm saying is correct, especially the third and fourth grip, you get a little confused. Okay, so the first maneuver, you put your hand on the fundus of the uterus and it permits the identification of the fetal lie, whether it's a vertical or a transverse lie and you can make out whether the fundus is having a head like in this case or a breech. So how do you say it's a breech or a head? A head would be hard and round and it will be more mobile, okay, it will be a firm uh, feeling or hard feeling, it will be easily mobile and breech would be large and nodular mass irregular large nodular mass would be the breech firm or uh, hard would be the head and spherical round would be a head and irregular and large nodular mass would be the breech so the first grip you can make out what's on the fundus then after that you go on the sides of the abdomen so when you go on the sides that is the second maneuver and with the sides you know you don't move your hands together keep one hand static move the other hand then keep this static 
move the first hand. With that, you can make out what's on the sides. So on one side, a hard resistance structure is felt. That is the back, like in this case here. And the other side, numerous small irregular mobile parts are felt. So that are the extremities, all right? So that's what is shown in this picture, the second maneuver. Let's take the third maneuver or the third loophole uh, maneuver, third loophole grip or the first pavlik or pelvic grip. So in this, we face the mother's head. We are facing the mother, looking at her face and holding the lower part of her abdomen with the hands like this. Okay, that's what is shown here. It is for fetal presentation. The thumb and fingers of one hand, generally the right hand because you're standing on the right of the mother. So your right hand while facing the mother's face, you're seeing whether it's the bellotable head here or it's the breech here. So the thumb and the fingers of one hand grasp the lower portion and find usually the head. Okay, in this picture, it's the breech. Okay, let's move on. The fourth maneuver, now you turn away from the head of the mother and you're uh, looking at the feet of the mother. So this is the fourth leopold or the second pelvic grip. While facing the feet of the mother, you put your hands like this. So when you put your hands and if they converge, if you put your hands into the, try to put them into the symphysis pubis and you can join your fingers, then it means that the pelvis is not having any part of the baby engaged. If you're able to join, that means the head is not engaged. But when you put your hands and it diverts, your hands divert, then that means the head has gone into the pelvis. Okay, so checks the descent and the examiner faces the mother's feet. Fingertips of both hands are positioned on either side of the presenting part, like here you can see. And presenting part, if engaged or not, is easily found out. That's what I've told you just now. Okay. So uh, this is the uh, full explanation of these uh, grips and I'm not reading this. Why am I telling you? This is a very famous uh, operative obstetrics book and this is one of the, you know, the guides which we use to learn obstetrics and how we do vacuums and forces. Excellent book. Those who become obstetricians uh, amongst you, please buy this book, the latest edition, because it's still being uh, printed and still in circulation. It's an excellent book for obstetrics, operative obstetrics. So that book, tells us so nicely about the first, second, third and the fourth maneuver. And the fourth maneuver, I just want to tell you, the surgeon turned towards the patient's feet. Okay, so just because some of you still keep feeling that, uh, you know, the uh, uh, third and fourth, you keep getting confused. So I'm not telling you what you get confused about because uh, you may take that as a carry home message. I'm not telling you what's the confusion. I've just told you that the third and the fourth grip I've shown you from Williams and from Operative Obstetrics book that these indeed are the third and fourth grips, the leopolds, which are known as pelvic one and pelvic two. Okay, so what are the calories addition? Uh, let's talk about the nutrition in pregnancy when we are talking about antenatal care. So calories in the first trimester don't have to give any extra calories because till 12 weeks, nothing really extra is required. But yes, second trimester onwards, you must increase calories addition, increase by 350 kilocalories per day. And in the third trimester, increase by 450 kilocalories per day. And uh, what are the macro and the micronutrients which are required in uh, pregnancy? So macronutrients like carbs, proteins and fats, they're all required more in pregnancy. We know that. How do we split them? So the total energy requirement is uh, let's say for a non-pregnant uh, woman or a man, we say around 20 to 24 kilocalories per kg per day. And if a person is obese, we should stick the calories to around 20. If the person is uh, uh, less weight or normal weight, we can go up to 24 kilocalories per kg per day. But in pregnancy, it goes up to 35 to 40. Now, when 35 to 40 kilocalories per kg per day are given, we say 50% should be by the carbohydrates and around 30% should be by the proteins and 20% should be by the fats. Okay. So um, what about the proteins? We must give around 1 gram per kg per day protein. So for a 60 kg woman, 60 grams, we know that very regularly it's been taught to you in your biochemistry also and your PSM. So we must double it in the last few weeks because as the pregnancy advances, the nutrition demands increase. But what are the micronutrients, which are vitamins and minerals? A lot of discussion about them these days. That vitamins like folic acid, we must know that the requirement is 400 micrograms per day. But if there are neural tube defects and if the person is on anti-epileptics, then the demand increases to 
4 milligram per day so that's the difference and the requirement if they ask you or replacement if they ask you so you know you must be very careful because if a person is having a requirement asked then we must say it's 400 micrograms or 0.4 mg like we say you can also say 0.4 mg some people might give you a 0.5 mg choice also okay so this is what is the normal requirement and what is the replacement if a person is having neural tube defects how much more you have to give how much addition has to be given so then we say 4 mg per day some books may ask you some exams may ask you 5 milligrams per day okay fine vitamin can cause vitamin a vitamin a can cause congenital malformations when taken in high doses more than 10,000 international units per day and uh, uh, you know most of the multivitamins do have vitamin a supplementation but that is not the any vitamin a it's the beta carotene congener of vitamin a which is safe in pregnancy so beta carotenoids if they are given they are safe in pregnancy and uh, they are in minuscule amount which will not cause any problems okay so vitamin a be very careful about that so you don't have to give a high replacement whatever is there in the multivitamins should be less than 10,000 international units and the beta carotenoids are used so vitamin c it's around 80 to 85 milligrams per day around 20 percent more than in non-pregnant women now that's the question which came to you in the INICT exams recently around 15 20 days back they asked you which one of the following micronutrients are required more in a pregnant woman and required more in a lactation so you people keep getting confused and keep thinking of calcium which is required more in lactation as compared to a pregnant or non-pregnant woman so i've uh, got the chart for you so vitamin c of course you must know is around 20 percent more than non-pregnant woman now let's see pregnancy and lactation the question came and between pregnancy and lactation what is the demand difference so vitamin a if you see in pregnancy it is 770 in a uh, lactation it is more vitamin a requirement becomes more what about vitamin c from 85 in pregnancy it becomes 120 milligrams in lactating see this comparison was between pregnancy and non-pregnancy so i'm just trying to tell you more information so if a person is using vitamin c in pregnancy it is 85 and in lactating women it is more and then carbohydrates if they are 175 in a pregnant woman they're 210 in a lactating woman so the ones in blue i have marked for you these are the ones which are more than normal and the commonly asked questions but yes what is not more the questions which you people get confused folic acid is not more in lactation as compared to pregnancy in fact it is lesser 600 in pregnancy and 500 micrograms in non in lactating women in calcium see it is not increased this is the one which you marked most of you and uh, that was uh, a wrong answer because calcium requirement in pregnancy and in lactation is the same it is 1000 milligrams per day and iron please from pregnancy it reduces to uh, uh, lactating women so in pregnancy 27 milligrams per day elemental iron is required absorbed iron the elemental iron and in uh, lactating women it goes down to 9 milligrams okay so we know in pregnancy 1000 milligrams of iron that is the absorbed not the dose you know the dose given is 100 milligrams per day of elemental iron you know the ministry of health and family welfare uh, you know the WHO says 60 but we must go and say uh, what our ministry of health and family welfare says and that is 100 milligrams of elemental iron per day but how much gets absorbed out of that okay that's not much more than four to five uh, milligrams okay so elemental iron whatever you give not all of it is absorbed so we must say the total absorbed iron in whole of pregnancy how much is the demand that is 1000 milligrams should be absorbed in pregnancy because this amount of iron which is required in pregnancy cannot be made up by the dietary sources so we must always give replacement so that's why iron folic acid is given in pregnancy iron tablets are started after the 12 weeks we must give them to all pregnant women it's not that you know she's a well uh, a well to do person and come from a very affluent family and she's got a very good diet and rich in uh, meat and products and which are best source of iron even that woman requires iron supplementation so no amount of dietary iron can replace the requirement which is there in pregnancy so iron supplementation is a must in pregnancy and that is 
1000 milligrams total absorbed iron should be there throughout pregnancy. So that 1000 milligrams, you know, out of which 500 is required for the hemoglobin expansion and 300 is required for the fetus and for the placenta and 200 is what is wasted throughout the pregnancy. So that's the 1000 milligrams of iron which is required. Okay. So let's go and see how we see the fetal heart sounds in the second trimester. Uh, Doppler ultrasound to detect fetal heart sounds can be used as early by 10 weeks. And the fetal heart action ranges from 110 to 160. And the standard non-amplified stethoscope, you know, the one which you and me use ever since our internships, those can pick up the fetal heart rate, but not much before the 22 weeks okay uh, those of you who keep writing you know especially i keep catching interns they say you know they see antenatal women they write at 18 weeks fetal heart sounds hurt you know i personally cannot hear them before 24 weeks but yes by the book if you have to write the answer the answer is 22 weeks and beyond so after 22 weeks you can if you have a good stat then you have the best you know litmens all of you have and with those litmens if you're seeing the fetal heart rate you can pick up by 22 weeks but yes I generally I've seen that with my stethoscope or with my uh, fetoscope also, you know, that conical uh, uh, aluminum uh, uh, instrument. With that also, I can make out only after 24. But yes, go ahead and answer 22 weeks. That's the one which they've asked you. With the stethoscope, beyond 22 weeks, you can hear the fetal heart sounds. So what are the investigations which we can do in pregnant women, especially in the Second trimester onwards, what you can do, we can do the neural tube defect screening by 11 weeks. And what are the neural tube defects you can make out by then? At neural tube defects at 11 to uh, 14 weeks, the only ones which you can make out in the first trimester is the anencephaly and the acrania. Of course, much larger defects can be made out by 15 to 20 weeks. Of course, apart from the neural tube defect screening, we can also do the uh, screening for the enuploides. Now, the enuploidy, enuploidy screening can be done as early as, you know, the 11 to 12 weeks when we call it the dual marker where you have the HCG and the PAP-A, isn't it? And... Uh, we can do around the 12 to 13 weeks the ultrasound for the uh, nuchal thickness and the nasal bone. You know, if the nuchal thickness is more than 3 millimeters, uh, when we see at the nape of the neck, isn't it? If it is more than 3 millimeters, then it is too much. It correlates with cardiac defects and anomalies. And if the nasal bone is very small and we can also do the triple marker, you know, after the 16th week onwards, 16th week onwards, we can do the triple marker and uh, we can also do the quadruple marker. Details of all of this I've discussed in the app so many times and you know that the triple marker is having the HCG, alpha fetoprotein and the unconjugated yeast triol and the quadruple marker is also having the inhibin. And mind you, if it is Down syndrome which you are thinking then in that HCG will be higher than normal and inhibin will be higher than normal. So that's the triple marker. But what is very important that we must also look at fetal DNA now. You know, the non-invasive prenatal testing, NIPT. The NIPT or we also call it the NIFTY, non-invasive fetal testing for trisomy. You know, many names are there. But what do we do with the NIPT? Now, NIPT is a screening test for the cell-free DNA, cell-free DNA, the fetal DNA can start coming to the metal circulation around 10 weeks and beyond. So around 10 weeks and beyond, let's say 12 weeks, we can pull out blood from the mother's vein and that blood may have the fetal DNA and with that fetal DNA, you can find out whether the fetus is having Down syndrome or the trisomy 13 or the uh, 16 or whatever, you know, when it's a monosomy, you can make out all these defects when we do the fetal DNA assessment. So they do a whole lot of screening and this is as sensitive as 98%. Most books say 98 to 99% sensitive is the NIPT to pick out defects. Okay, we see the cell free DNA, but mind you, it is not a diagnostic test. Now, please remember this NIPT is coming in discussions. It is used still as a screening process at best. It is better screening than the triple marker and the quadruple marker, but if you have a doubt, 
then you can do this screening because this is almost 98, 99% sure. But what is 100% sure? If you want to find out for 100% sure that the fetus is having or not having Downs, then you will have to take out fetal cells. Then around 16 weeks to and beyond that is more than 16 weeks, we can do after 16 weeks, we can do the amniocentesis and around 11 to 13 weeks, we can do the coronic villus sampling. So this will tell you for sure. Okay, so these are the screening tests, all of these, the ones which I've told you, and this is the CVS and the amniocentesis are telling for sure. You can also do a chordocentesis after 18, 19 weeks. You can do the chordocentesis and take out fetal blood, and you can run the karyotype and the uh, aneuploidy screen. Now, you must do the GDM screening around the 28 weeks. I've discussed about this even earlier when we give you the list. And this, of course, is with the 75 grams of glucose. And you know that the you have to have the 1-hour value and the 2-hour value only now and the fasting value, of course. So fasting should be less than 92. And after giving 75 grams of glucose, 1-hour should be less than 180 and 2-hour should be less than 153. Less, okay? If it is 153, it is considered to be abnormal. Less than 153. Now, that is what is a, I'm not saying less than equal to. I'm not saying less than equal to, okay? I'm saying less than 153. So, 92 also is high. Less than 92 is good. Be very careful about this. One step screening test now. Okay. Now, let's see the drugs in pregnancy categorization. We know that uh, this uh, standardization keeps changing so many times. But yes, category A, B, C, D and category X. Now, the A is the safest uh, group of drugs which we use in pregnancy. And the multivitamins come here. And the thyroid supplement like the thyroxin comes here. Category B, they are safe in animals. But we don't have adequate human studies. Few studies which are done in humans, it is safe. So these are drugs like metronidazole and um, you know uh, drugs like didanosin. These are safe in uh, 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 humans, but more data would be nice. Now category C, these are the drugs which are they are known to be uh, teratogens for animals. In animals, it is a known teratogen, but in humans, few studies which we've done, it is safe. I wish there were more studies for this, but for the studies which we've done so far, it is a safe drug for humans. So these are majority of the drugs like, you know, the drugs uh, which are given in pregnancy most commonly like the anti-malarials like the chloroquine and anti-epileptics like lamotrigin and the levetiracetam. All of these are the category C drugs. Now, category D drugs, known human teratogens. They are known to be teratogens in humans, but the benefits outweigh the risks. So, we give them, tell the patient that, okay, it is required for you. I know it can cause harm to the fetus, but the chances are not so much. It is not surely going to cause. The chances are there, but the benefits are better than the risks from the drugs. So, the antiepileptics like the phenytoin, it is, if it is uh, given in pregnancy, we say that, yes, it's a teratogen, but for benefit we can give. Of course, that's not a very good example now because lamotrigine and levetiracetam, these drugs have come which are much safer than phenytoin. So, they come in the category C. So, phenytoin is a one drug here or the carbamazepine comes here. Okay. Now, category X which are not to be given because they are known teratogens but they are definitely not having enough information that okay with this drug i can give it in pregnancy the benefits are definitely less than the risk so risk outweigh the benefits that's why these drugs are contraindicated not to be given in pregnancy drugs like lithium for example and uh, cancer chemotherapy drugs and androgens tetracyclines and alcohol you know the list is a very long list okay so those are the drugs in pregnancy uh, let me just tell you a little bit about the anti-seizure medication because uh, this keeps coming in your exams so we must stop it before pregnancy the anti-epileptics and um, uh, why should we stop it before pregnancy because most of these drugs can cause you know even lamotrigin has got unacceptable nasal hyperplasia kind of defects but it is still in category c so yes those women who satisfy the following criteria, we can stop the drug before pregnancy. So those have been uh, free of seizures for the last two to five years and uh, they have a single type of seizure 
and uh, have a normal neurological examination and have a normal EEG. So if all of this is normal, then we can go ahead and stop the anti-epileptic medication. And the drugs which are given in uh, uh, epilepsy in pregnancy, which are safer than others, see, I marked them for you so that you can understand that lamotrigine, if you see, the malformation risk is much lesser. It is 2% here, it is 2.4% here in levetiracetam and look what topiramate and valproate and um, carbonzepine, phenytoin, they are all more, okay. Now, one thing I want to tell you about phenobarbital, you know, uh, of course, this confusion no longer exists that, you know, long time back, at least uh, seven, eight years back, a lot of people used to have these guidebooks saying that the phenobarbital is the safest drug and the best drug and the drug of choice for place in pregnancy. Now, that is outdated beyond, you know, ages ago, it was outdated. So, don't even think about phenobarbital and for all of you who did not know, please, phenobarbiton is not also totally safe. It is known to cause neural tube defects and it is 5.5% congenital malformations, much more than all the other drugs. So, I think most of you know that phenobarbiton is not to have any discussion regarding management of epilepsy in pregnant women. Okay. So, uh, other information, anti-epileptics, if a woman is taking, she should be advised to take a daily 4 milligrams per day of folic acid. Okay, women on antiepileptics don't take just the normal uh, requirement. They don't take 0.4, they take 4 milligrams per day of folic acid. So, there's a lot of uh, questions about exercise in pregnancy and exercise in pregnancy, actually there's no need to limit exercise. Of course, but this is not the time to start weight lifting and start uh, jogging a 100 meter uh, sprint, okay. Moderate exercise, till that time, it is not a contraindication. So, Moderately intense exercise is permitted in pregnancy for around 150 minutes per week and don't get into fatigue. You don't have to start exercising pregnancy what you never did in uh, non-pregnant state. You don't have to start in pregnancy. If you're a person who's used to exercise, limit your exercise in pregnancy and moderate intensity exercise can be done for around 150 minutes a week. And contraindications, a person who's got significant cardiovascular disease, is in preterm labor, had a circlage, twins and if there is significant bleeding, preterm labor or premature rupture of membranes, of course, with all these disorders which I have mentioned here, you will definitely not allow her to have any exercise, you will be giving her bed rest, okay. Also contraindications are obstetrical complications like preeclampsia, plus previa, anemia, poorly controlled diabetes and epilepsy, morbid obesity and IUGR. What is the management of IUGR race? What did I tell you is the management of IUGR? Please, I never told you give too much of food in IUGR. I said resting in a lateral position either left lateral or right lateral the venous return increases to the heart of the mother and the output of the mother increases and even IUGR babies are known to benefit with this of course give her adequate diet too much of diet is not going to help if she is malnourished give her adequate diet that goes without saying but you don't have to give her too much of diet okay so what about travel in pregnancy now automobile travel is allowed okay of course uh, don't have to make it unnecessarily bumpy you can drive it at a normal uh, speed i mean uh, driving in a safe speed and uh, using the safe lane and not uh, rushing uh, with automobiles that's fine and very important that a pregnant woman can drive but driving or sitting in the you know passenger seat the seat belt has to be always put and when the abdomen is distended, the seat belt is not across the abdomen, it is below the bulge of the abdomen, okay. So this is the correct way of the seat belt, it should come below the, below the uterus, you know, at the level of almost the symphysis, you must ask her to put the belt, the tummy should be above the belt and the upper one, upper belt should be between the breasts. So the breast is engorged and it will hurt a lot to have the belt going over the breast. So between the breast, the upper strip and the lower part of the belt should be below the bulge of the abdomen. Okay. Air travel is also safe till 36 weeks of pregnancy and uh, of course beyond 36 weeks also no, no harm happens. It's just that a woman can deliver and having a midair delivery is uh, often going to be a problem. Recently, there was a lot of information about a woman who delivered uh, uh, on air and of course the staff was smart enough to do the delivery. But you know, a delivery can have catastrophic uh, side effects and PPH can happen and best time to travel is before 36 weeks 
by air if at all and uh, that also you know has to be certified by an obstetrician that even if she's going before 36 weeks you know she's 33 34 weeks pregnancy it has to be certified by the uh, obstetrician that she's not in preterm labor and this two hours or three hours of journey is safe for the patient okay now uh, that's about automobile transfer and air travel but there's something about coitus which everybody keeps asking and uh, coitus in pregnancy there's a a lot of discussion and a lot of people keep having, uh, you know, various, uh, you know, traditional thoughts about uh, coitus in pregnancy and a lot of people say that, you know, coitus is taboo in pregnancy and why are you even talking about coitus in pregnancy? And even I've asked my residents sometimes, you know, those who, uh, you know, uh, advise, I've overheard some of my residents talking to these uh, patients and they've always said that don't have sex in pregnancy and in fact, the, you know, pregnant women are sometimes uh, pushed by the husbands you know they are not coming inside the clinic the pregnant woman is there inside with the resident and the resident is talking and the husband is waiting outside what the resident is going to tell and every time he's been pushing the uh, wife that uh, this time go and ask you know whether it's allowed please uh, sex in pregnancy coitus in pregnancy is not contraindicated if the woman is in good health of course she should not be having any complications so yes uh, first trimester second or third trimester uh, coital activity is only in going to increase the bondage and uh, women do have a reduced drive in the first time first trimester of pregnancy they have reduced in the reduction in the drive but in the second trimester actually it increases so yes it's a good time a safe time to have uh, intercourse because she's already pregnant and it's not going to harm the fetus in any way and uh, you know of course the frequency can be reduced yes so coitus is safe but yes I can say probably a reduced frequency uh, from whatever it was before the uh, pregnancy, uh, before she got pregnant, a reduced frequency probably is a good advice. And, uh, you know, having intercourse uh, when uh, there is, uh, you know, a need to have intercourse is not going to cause any harm. But yes, if there is a problem like she's aborting placenta previa, threatened preterm labor, obviously the pregnant woman is in a condition where she's herself not going to allow intercourse to happen and the, I'm sure the husband will also understand. So having intercourse and having a physical relation is only going to increase the love and affection and is not contraindicated in any possible way. All right. So yes, I thought I'll just discuss about something which is often asked amongst the students, if not in the exams, it's not been asked in the exam, but I thought I'd myself will, might as well push this much of information along with all that I've told you. Alright, so a lot about antenatal care we've discussed and I hope all of that was useful. A lot of MCQs which have come in the recent um, exam I've discussed here. Something, uh, there was another question about uh, what is the best way to reduce the pain when a person is having leg cramps in pregnancy. So that is something which uh, I thought I'll tell you as a question which came and that's part of the antenatal care. So if she's having calf cramps, you know, if she's got cramps in the calf, then you, you must try to do then opposite action so that the calf is given some respite. So yes, the calf causes plantar flexion at the ankle. So you can ask the pregnant woman to dorsiflex. So dorsiflexion will give relief in the cramps in the calf. Similarly, if there are, uh, you know, uh, hamstring uh, cramps, hamstring cramps, you know, that is uh, hamstrings cause flexion at the knee joint. So extending the limb, extending the lower limb is going to give relief. Similarly, if there are cramps in the thigh, you know, thighs cause extension. So if their thighs are having cramps, then tell the mother to flex the uh, leg joint. That is going to give some relief. All right. So whatever action is going to cause the cramps, doing the opposite action is going to be beneficial. And the question which came to you people in the exam was, what can you tell the mother? What kind of position of the mother should keep when she's having leg cramps or the commonly asked the cramps of the calf for that dorsiflexion is the best position. All right. So all that information for antenatal care, I hope it was useful. And uh, all of you, if you have uh, any discussions to be done regarding the antenatal care, you can always write to me on the forum. All right. God bless and do a very good exam. Bye-bye.